Hello, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Mo. And this is Team Get Over Yet. We're an all-female team participating in the greatest motoring adventure on the planet, the Mongol Rally. We'll be driving 10,000 miles across mountains, deserts, and unknown terrain. And along the way, we hope to spread our feminist and environmental ideals. Join us here as we share our stories, thoughts, and interviews as we get ready for the Mongol Rally 2021. Uh, don't you mean 2022? Shit! Good day! Hey, welcome back! Uh, In today's episode, we thought it would be nice to talk about adventuring, since much of the world is now opening up a bit. Heck yeah, it is! And uh, this time we're going to do something a little bit different. Caitlin did the research, and then she's going to tell me, well, uh, actually tell all of us about it, but I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. So uh, what are we talking about? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, today we're going to talk about female explorers, or Ooh. women who walked the world, if you will. I'm going to read a couple of stories to you, and yeah, feel free to chime in whenever you want, okay? Yeah, got it. All right, ready? Let's do it. Uh, let's do it. <laughs> do let's it. go. <laughs> Don't let your dreams be dreams. <laughs> let's just do it. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know about you, but when I was taught history in grade school and the topic of explorers came up, we usually were taught about old European dudes who did a little less exploring and a little more invading, Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Columbus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lewis and Clark. I mean, eh. yeah. Samuel de Champlain. Yeah. As a Canadian one, but. (laughs) I was like Canada. uh, (laughs) As a Canada. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But. But anyway, I I never questioned it at the time, but now as an adult, I often find myself wondering if any women got itchy feet in the past and what their accomplishments were, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, fair fair. question. Yeah, so with most things, I assume that there were many female explorers, but they probably didn't get the credit or the acknowledgement they deserved. It's only relatively recently that I heard the name of a few explorers thanks to the internet and the tenacity of archivists and historians. Hats off to you guys. Yay! Seriously. No, seriously. I always wanted to be a hist- uh, like a librarian slash historian who just like found the lost information. Unfortunately. Oh, yeah. No, no uh, <laughs> short attention span I have. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to be you got to be really hyper focused in those uh, kind of fields to be pouring over old books and old records and stuff all day. But very important work. Yeah. Very important work. Very. Yeah. So anyway, today I want to highlight a few of the female explorers of the past and talk about their incredible journeys and discoveries. Uh, and in no way is this a complete list. So I implore you, Mo, and you, the listeners, uh, to do some research of your own because like, I've definitely omitted a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to talk about three people today. Obviously, there are way more explorers than that. Yeah. So you can do your own research. But so the first, yeah, the first person that I'm going to talk about is Jeanne Barre, who is the first woman to circumnavigate the globe. Oh, isn't that cool? That's really cool. Is, does she uh, use like a boat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I mean, she was a passenger on the boat. She was in no way driving the boat, driving the boat, steering the boat. Um <laughs> But but her story is really interesting. So, uh, Jeanne Barre was born in 1740 in the town of La Comelle in the east of France. She was born to a poor family, and it's most likely that her mother died when she was only 15 months old. Mm. So, I mean, like, this is 1740, so, like, the... Not, not uh, unusual. Oh, I mean, yeah, not unusual. Of course, like, a lot of people are dying of dysentery and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's also, there's not much known about her because mm-hmm. it was just so long ago and she never really kept a diary or anything. And it's, it's, it's likely that she didn't even know how to read or write. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like the information about her is kind of scant. Um, but eventually she became a servant under the service of one Philibert Comalson, a naturalist who studied zoology, botany, and natural history, mm. and who is most famous for his observations in Tahiti. Okay. So in 1765, Jeanne disguised herself as a man and accompanied Commerson on a trip around the globe. 
Having become an herb woman herself, Jeanne was allowed to go on Louis Antoine de Bougainville's expedition as Com Commerson's, I'm just going to say his English name, Commerson's assistant, uh, but like assistant, more like a servant. Yeah. Little is known about Jeanne since it appears she did not keep a journal, like I said, but an account of her life has been pieced together from the journals of the famous men with whom she traveled. Mm. So it's kind of interesting because like you're, unfortunately, we can't really see her life through her own lens like her own perspective yeah. yeah so it's kind of like we can't we don't really get like the full details of her life because it's just like little mentions and like other men's journals and so anyway but we can we can kind of surmise what happened um but anyway yeah many of the plants collected on the trip which amounted to thousands of unique specimens were likely mostly collected by Jeanne Commerson was gravely injured in the early legs of the voyage, and so Jeanne had to do much of the heavy lifting, mm -hmm. which is typical. But, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> she was often described as being a hard worker and well-mannered, in addition to being an expert botanist. Oh, right. Upon arrival in Tahiti, Jeanne was quickly identified as a woman by locals. <laughs> yeah, instead of getting in trouble, Bougainville ruled that she should be left alone, That's and good. Jeanne was able to continue her journey. Actually, so when I was doing research about this, um, some people in certain books, like this is all speculative, but yeah. they were thinking that the reason why she got discovered as a woman is because she was possibly raped, but oh, it's hmm. not confirmed. And yeah, and like nobody's really sure about it. And apparently, like in a lot of other journals, like they kept uh, saying that she was a virtuous woman. So it's likely that she probably was not. Um in in my mind, when I read this the first time, I, like I was just thinking that the Europeans were just so, how can I say, like out of touch and like unobservant that they were just like, yeah, she's totally a dude. And like, meanwhile, she's like having her period and she's like, oh man, my tits hurt so much. And they're just like, oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's normal for men. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just feel like I, I want to say like the, the European men were just like totally clueless. Right. And oh. they just never realized that she was a woman. But as soon as she gets to Tahiti, uh -huh. the Tahitian men are just like, that's a woman. <laughs> yeah. That's a chick. Dude. <laughs> that's, that's a girl. That's a girl. Well, I, also, I also feel like probably the European men are like, she also may have had like mild period symptoms. Like I, I know that I personally like have almost no to oh, yeah. cramping. Even when I am on my period and like I have like a very few symptoms otherwise of like having uh, my menstrual cycle. So it's just like she may have been one of those ladies who didn't obviously show it. And so it was easy for her to hide it and cover it up for the period that she needed. Yeah, that's to. true. And I think like especially when you're living your life like she was. So like on a boat, you're kind of mm -hmm. malnourished. And then she was also doing, like I said, like most of the collecting. Probably. So she's like hiking all the time looking for plants and stuff. Yep. So I would imagine she might she might have been like kind of malnourished, very thin. Uh she might not have been like having a period. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 So Yeah, yeah. You gotta gotta think of all the people who are in high stress athletic positions who right. Sometimes have irregular cycles or uh, miss their cycles entirely just because they're so stressed out or because they're so physically active that it just messes with their hormone levels. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very true. So eventually, she and Commerson ended up in Mauritius, where Commerson later died. Of course. Oh, <laughs> so sad. Well, I mean, he was he was really sick for most of the journey, so it's just whenever they kind of landed, it was just finally time to kick the bucket. Um, but this is not the end of Jeanne's story. So it was only recently that the latter episodes of her life were revealed. Jeanne was rewarded for her work and was given a pension from the French Navy. Isn't that exciting? That is very exciting. Yeah, because she wasn't even supposed to be originally on the boat, but like, you know, she did so much work and... Uh, They're just like, I mean... Well, yeah, and like, they were just really impressed with her and they were just like, yeah, you're a cool guy. Like, here's a pension. Um, and eventually she started a business, which was a bar. Oh, cool. Heck yeah. And yeah. Yeah, and she amassed a small fortune. So when she married, so eventually, like after opening her bar and being in operation for a couple of years, she got married and <laughs> she got her fiance to sign a prenup. <laughs> Smart girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because she like, I mean, she had, I think something like four times the amount of money that he had. It was pretty cool. So in 1775, she returned to France where she took in her orphaned niece and nephew and she bought a bunch of properties, including a farm that still exists today. 
Oh, nice. Mm. Does her family still, or her niece's family still live on the farm or is it? That's an excellent question. I'm not sure. I just, I did, it was just like a brief, brief mention, uh, in one of the websites that I was reading and it's like, oh yeah, the farm still is still there. And I'm like, oh, cool story. Cool, <laughs> cool nice. stuff. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So like, I mean, people kind of knew about her, um, at the time, like Bougainville, after Bougainville, like went back to France after he did his mm-hmm. circumnavigating of the globe. Uh, I think like he released a book about the travels and he like briefly mentioned Jeanne in it. And he talked about her like in Tahiti, she kind of confessed, I guess, like some people were like, that's a woman. And then she was like, I am a woman. And she confessed. And so he, he, (laughs) yeah, so he, he, yeah, he wrote that, um, in his journal, which got published later. So people kind of knew about her, but like, I mean, nothing about the rest of her life or nothing about like the beginning of her life either. So then that's when historians and archivists kind of came in and they like poured over, you know, town records, marriage certificates, you know, the the prenup, right, legal documents and stuff. And then they kind of sort of eventually made together what they had. Yeah. Yeah. Account of her life. It's very cool. It's very interesting. Yeah. She was a cool person. They're all cool people. Everyone's cool. Women's going out there and being like, you know what? You said I can't watch me. Are Watch always, me. Always great stories. I love I love reading about them. I love hearing about them. And I love watching them on like TV and things like that. Oh, like, yeah. Those are the strong female characters that we need to see more often in movies and TV shows. We don't yeah. we don't need the damsels anymore. We need we need strong role models. Yeah. And like all of these, like I mean, like all of these exploring ladies are like mm-hmm. absolutely definitely excellent role models. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, so the next person that I'm going to talk about is Mary Seacole, who is a globe-trotting nurse. Hey. This this woman I have heard of before briefly, um, but I didn't really know her whole story, so it was kind of really mm-hmm. nice doing the research about her so I could learn a little bit more. Um, sure. So Mary Seacole was born in 1805 in Kingston, Jamaica. Her father was a Scottish soldier and her mother was a Jamaican woman who was knowledgeable in traditional medicines, a skill she passed on to her daughter. The this family so familiar. Sorry. Yeah. As, yeah. You're, as you're talking about it, it's like. <laughs> I mean, I think I feel like I did watch a TV show or I listened to a podcast or something about her. Um, mm-hmm. But but yeah, it's kind of a familiar story. And it's like. We'll talk about this in a second, but you'll be like, oh, what? Oh. <laughs> so, <but> anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So the family owned a boarding house and Mary began to care for the sick guests from a young age. When she was 13, she traveled to England with relatives and was able to learn about modern European healing techniques over the course of a year. So she has kind of this like mixture of like modern European kind of mm-hmm. well, yeah techniques. Western and medicine. Western medicine. Yeah, and then and this like kind of a mix of both, which is very interesting. Hmm. In 1823, at the age of 18, her travels began in earnest. She spent two years in London. Then she went on to travel to Cuba, Haiti, and the Bahamas, where she studied local medicine and curative techniques. Finally, she returned to Kingston in 1826. So, I mean, she's still very young, but mm-hmm. she's been to England twice. She's been kind of like all over the the, the West Indies. She's well, been yeah. all over, yeah, the Caribbean and stuff. That's a and lot like, of time on a boat. <laughs> it's a lot of boat time. Oh yeah, for a lot sure. Of boat time, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like the whole time, like she's learning different kinds mm-hmm. of medicine, right? Which is pretty cool. In 1836, she married Edwin Horatio Seacole, who unfortunately died in 1844 because. That's what happens, um, despite <laughs> Mary's best efforts to save him. Sadly, when it rains, it pours, and Mary's mother died just a few months later. Mary was badly shaken, as you can imagine, but her grief did not stop her from traveling to Panama in 1851 to fight a cholera outbreak in the town of Crucis. After many years of treating cholera and yellow fever patients, both at home and abroad, she was invited to supervise the hospital at the British Army's headquarters in Kingston, She also renovated her family's boarding house into a hospital after a fire. Oh, okay. And that's, and I mean, you can't, you can't see the pictures, but she's, you know, her mother's Jamaican. So she's a black woman. Um, And then to be invited to be the supervisor of like the British army's hospital. 
that's significant. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. In the 1800s, yeah. man, she's yeah, killing it. it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she's very skilled. Um, and so because of how much she cared for British soldiers, Mary felt compelled to go to Europe and nurse injured soldiers during the Crimean War. Uh, mm -hmm. She was refused by the British War Office for racial reasons. Of course. Yeah. So, like... You know, she's she's already doing this job in Jamaica. I know. But like, as soon as she gets over to like England, they're like, no, you cannot. You cannot do it. It's impossible. But but anyway, so that didn't stop her from going to Crimea anyway. With the help of her husband's cousin, Thomas Day, she opened a quote unquote hotel in <laughs> Balaclava, which was very close to the front lines. Wounded soldiers would go to her hotel, quote unquote, for treatment. She posed as a sutler, which is a new word for me, but sutler is a civilian merchant who sells goods to the army. Okay. Hmm. But her real intention was to treat wounded soldiers. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and apparently, so she was often even seen on like the front lines, right in the battlefields, like helping soldiers, treating the wounded, saving lives. Right. So yeah. like, this is like, this is a really awesome example of a woman who was just like, you know, no, I have a goal. This is something I want to do. And, you know, men told her no. And she was just like, I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm going to make my own way. Oh, you, you're going to tell me no. All right. Fuck you. Bye. I'm going to go do it anyways. Yeah. And then, but it's kind of interesting. So, like, some something else significant is happening at the same time hmm. as this. Uh, maybe Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. But number one, Crimean War. Mm-hmm. It's like 1853, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, then nurses. I see your face. Hey. It's like nothing. <laughs> but, I froze but, also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But does the name Florence Nightingale ring a bell? <gasps> oh, it does. Okay. It does. So, so like that's that's when Florence Nightingale became famous. So this is like literally happening at the same time. Mary hey. Seacole's story and Florence Nightingale's story is happening at the same time. But, but... One is a black woman and one is a white woman. So like like these days, like, you know, everyone's like, well, Florence Nightingale, Florence. Mary Seacole was doing the exact same thing. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But because I guess because she's a woman of color, like it just it didn't stick in history. <laughs> but anyway, these days, like her story is being revived and people are kind of finally giving her the credit that she deserves because she was. Right. Yeah, she was doing the same thing, but she's just, you know, in a different way. Um, but yeah. And at the time this is happening so her name mary seacole was as famous as florence nightingales in oh, britain yeah at, at the time everybody knew mary like oh yeah mary seacole she's great she's a great nurse she saved my life mm -hmm. um etc and then after the crimean war she, she wrote a biography an autobiography which was the wonderful adventures of mrs seacole in many lands and it was a huge hit huge hit in 1857 um, re regrettably, her name, like I said, fell into obscurity in most of the world until 2004. Oh. So in 2004, yeah, a group of nurses visited London, England from the Caribbean, designing to pay their respects to Mary's grave, which sparked renewed interest in this kind of healer explorer. Right. Uh, she was voted the greatest Black Britain, and a statue of her was erected in 2016 at St. Thomas's Hospital in London, South Bank. Mm. Well, I'm glad that she got the recognition that she deserved oh, yeah. like during her time and then again after her time, after her passing and everything. It yeah. took a couple hundred years for it to re reemerge, <laughs> but <Yeah>. it happened. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. So anyway, so our last person, our last uh, uh, adventuring woman is Nellie Bly. Hmm. Name also sounds vaguely familiar, but I'm also... Yeah, I know. I know. It's all yeah, vaguely familiar. <laughs> um, but she is the fastest woman around the world. Oh, at, well, at the time. So I think I'm sure people have done it faster now with the airplanes and stuff. But at the time, she was <laughs> the fastest. So Nellie was born in 1864 in Pennsylvania, USA. And although her name at the time was Elizabeth Cochran. So Nellie, Nellie Bly was a pen name that she adopted later. Ah, yeah, but Elizabeth that's what she's Cochran like. Elizabeth Cochran is more familiar. That name. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
like with all of our uh, all of our women so far, tragically, her father died when she was only six years old, which plunged the family into financial hardship. Mm. Uh, she attended school for a while, intending to become a teacher, but due to money problems, she was forced to give up her education and move to Pittsburgh with her mother, where they opened a boarding house. Hmm. Lots right. of boarding houses. I mean, it's the, thing, it's the easiest thing to do back in the day for a woman. Exactly. Independ- independently run a boarding house. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, it was it, it, be a teacher or have a boarding house. That's pretty much all. Like, that's it. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, in 1882, at the age of 18, Nellie responded to a sexist editorial in the Pittsburgh Dispatch, where the author Erasmus Wilson said that women were monsters for working, in a very attention-grabbing <laughs> way. Yeah. So, yeah. So she read this and then she wrote a response to it, and she was just like, "You pig." Yep. Actually, I don't know what she said. Yeah, but whatever whatever it was um, that she said, it was so attention grabbing that she was able to get the attention of the newspaper's editor, George Madden, who offered her a job. Oh, isn't that cool? That's awesome. So yeah, so after that, so she became a writer, and as a writer for the Pittsburgh Dispatch, Nellie wrote about women's rights issues. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah, way yep. to go. And, uh, and she started to become known for her undercover investigations. Mm. So actually, she's kind of like the mother of investigative journalism. Nice. That's awesome. It's really cool. So during this time, she pretended to be a sweatshop worker, and she revealed the poor working conditions that women faced at that factory that she was undercover in. It was pretty cool. Nice. And like really popular writing. Like a lot of people read uh, her articles. But unfortunately, probably due to hurt egos, she was banished to the women's page, probably writing about sewing patterns or recipes or something, and which she obviously hated. She wanted to do like the nitty gritty important yeah, the, stuff, the, right? The important stuff, yes. Yeah, I, I guess like I'm guessing like she, like the men, because she was probably maybe the only woman or one of the only women mm-hmm. who was writing for the newspaper and she was getting so popular and she was such a good writer that the other men at the newspaper were feeling butthurt about it. So, of course. <laughs> yeah, so then they were like, oh, we can't have this. And they started making her write different stuff. But so she left. She left that place and she moved to the Big Apple. Here we go. New York City. In New York, she worked for the New York World, and she shot to fame after she pretended to be a mentally ill person and gained access to the New York City Mental Health Hospital, where she lived for 10 days and exposed the deplorable conditions there. It was really famous. Like, everybody in the country was reading that. Um, A few years ago, it was actually turned into a movie. It's a kind of, like, psychological horror thriller. Oh, okay. I think it's on Netflix. You guys can check it out. (laughs) <laughs> I forget the I forget the title, but like I just I saw it mentioned on the page, um, but pretty cool. And then in 1873, Jules Verne wrote "Around the World in 80 Days." Oh yeah. So which Nellie read and immediately wanted to attempt. So she proposed the idea to her bosses, who agreed that it would make a good story. Right. Oh heck yeah! Like you know, if if we get uh, one of our reporters to like try to attempt going around the world, it'd be great, awesome, lots of readers. But they wanted a man to go. Ah. Of course they did. <laughs> of course, they, yeah. yeah. It's course too dangerous did. for a woman to travel by herself. <laughs> so anyway, Nellie dug in her heels. And finally, in 1889, she set off on her journey. So she was able to go. In November, she departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, and traveled the world by ship, horse, rickshaw, sampan, which I'm not sure what that is, Mm. (laughs) burrow, like a donkey, and other vehicles and animals, and made her way around the world. It's so interesting. And there's like a couple of different things kind of going on at the same time, um, Mm. which I didn't include in the blog post, but I remember reading here and there. But there was like another newspaper who was trying to compete with her too. So they sent like their own female reporter yeah. around the world. Um, but like Nellie, Nellie didn't care about it at all. She was like, yeah, I mean, like if somebody wants to try to go faster than me, I mean, like they can. <laughs> and there was like a lot of betting going on. Uh-huh. So <laughs> of course, so like people were trying to bet like to the last minute of like how long it was going to actually take her to get like around the, around world. the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. 
Uh, yeah, and the news of her voyage made headlines, and people gathered to greet her and hear tales of her travels wherever she went. She traveled to England and France, Italy, Egypt, Sri Lanka, China, Singapore, and in Singapore, apparently she bought a monkey and she had a pet monkey, <laughs> and she went to yeah yeah it's pretty wild and she went to japan um when in china she visited a leper colony and apparently i read somewhere um that she also participated in the sino japanese war a little bit i'm not really sure how she participated but uh, right she did so <laughs> yeah anyway sounds great uh but it's pretty good considering she left the u.s with only the clothes on her back and a small bag mm-hmm. and she came back with a monkey and she came back with a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad. Not bad. No. Uh, so in the end, anyway, she completed the trip in, wait for it, 72 days, mm. six hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds. Nice. And of course, she became a star, right? Everybody knew her name after that. Um, she wrote a book about her travels, which was an instant bestseller. In 1895, she married an oil mogul who was much older than her. I think like he was in his 70s and she was 31. But then he died. <laughs> so after, <laughs> yeah, of course he did. So after he died, she took over the running of his company. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So as the boss, she treated her employees fairly and they were able to enjoy many benefits not offered elsewhere. Uh, so she really kind of like, I like, Obviously, like through her investigative journalism, she was a big advocate for, you know, the downtrodden, the poor. Uh, she wanted better conditions for everybody and she wanted everyone to live a good life. And she really practiced that whenever she had the opportunity to as like the owner of this oil company. Mm -hmm. um, and she also, while she was doing that, she patented a lot of inventions related to the oil industry, many of which are still in use today, which oh, is pretty cool. cool. Yeah, she's a really awesome lady. And but 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 eventually she gave so much to her employees that it led her to financial ruin. <laughs> yeah, you you got to find the balance of helping the employees out, but also making sure that your company still runs. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, good for I mean, good for I mean, her. Though. Good for her, though. Yeah, I yeah. I would love to have been an employee who worked for her at, at the time and like had oh heck yeah conditions. Yeah, for sure and benefits. <sighs> Yeah. In the last few years of her life, she returned to writing and reporting on many events related to the women's uh, women's suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. Nellie passed away in 1922 from pneumonia at the age of 57. Oh, well, unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of sad, but awesome lady. Super cool. Wow. She lived I mean, they're all life. super cool ladies. No, I know. They they all are. And they all lived a hell, hell of a life. Like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you imagine being in that in their situation where you know it's the 1800s at some point and women are seen as nothing more than mothers daughters and property owned by their husbands or family mm. to be mm. sold or used as as they're ch chosen to with mm -hmm. only a rare few having the opportunity to teach or uh you know pursue other careers outside of the family in the home mm-hmm and having the courage and the in the tenacity to just be like, screw you, I'm gonna mm -hmm. go do this thing, and if I have to disguise <laughs> myself, I will. I'm and then just doing do it. it, and then just doing it. Like, I don't know if I would have had the gall or the gumption to do it myself, but I, I, th I would like to think that I do would, but yeah. I'd imagine like it must have been like, I mean, even today, like mm -hmm. a lot of women struggle like doing what they want to do, like especially in certain fields like STEM yeah, um, <clears throat> or even even traveling like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, yeah, I know like we're both women and we both like to travel. But like anytime I say that I want to go somewhere, um, you people know, around me are just like <laughs> they give you looks and they're just like, are you sure that's a good idea? Isn't it dangerous? Are you going to go alone? You should take somebody with you. Granted, uh, and I mean, there are times where I, where I'm uncomfortable and I do want to take a travel buddy with me just so that oh, I sure. have somebody to like share the experience with, but also be like safety in numbers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, right. I, but I'm also like, you know, if I really want to do this thing, I'm not going to let not having somebody with me stop me from going. Yeah, I mean, there are ways to there are ways to stay safe, but yeah. it's just like, 
Yeah, I mean, totally. Yeah, well, a lot of people around me too are always just kind of like, especially since you're a woman, they're just kind of not supportive. Right. It was very, even today. So yeah, I can't imagine what it must have been like in that time because it's you're getting it from all sides everywhere and like very extreme. They did it, but they did it. They did. And it was, it's it's very interesting to hear. And like, I, I honestly would like support books about these women and like going out and reading like the the autobiographies that uh the last two women you mentioned wrote themselves like yeah hell if i could find a copy of that i'd read it oh heck yeah i'm sure it's i'm sure it's really interesting um especially nelly i would just i would assume that nelly's is probably really good because she's a good writer so <laughs> yeah i'll have to check that out at some point if you find a copy let me know okay yeah i'll send it uh, but anyway, I think that's all we got for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about female explorers. I certainly enjoyed doing the research. Yeah, no, it was so interesting. And But I do feel like we've left out a lot, but more room for me to research later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, we did. Um, there are and were a ton of female explorers out there. So I thought next month we could do uh, Women Who Walked the World Part 2. Sounds good to me. Uh, so to our listeners out there, if you enjoyed this month's episode, stay tuned next month to hear part two. And also, if you liked this episode, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, leave a comment, etc. on whatever platform you're listening to this on. You can also support us by becoming a Patreon. Patreons have access to exclusive content, AMAs, and more. Proceeds will be donated to the Center for Reproductive Rights and Cool Earth. All links are in the description. And check out our website to read our sources and the accompanying blog post on this episode. Well, uh, that's it for today. See you next month. Bye-bye. That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, please support this work by subscribing and donating to our cause at www.teamgetoveryit.com. Donors get access to specific content like stickers, t-shirts, and postcards from our journey. You can donate for as little as $5 and the benefits build from there. Go to our website for more info or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Team Get Over It. Thanks for listening and catch us next time on Get Over It. Mauritius. Actually, wait a minute. I'm going to double check the pronunciation of that one. All right. Give me one second. I got to let my dog out. She's whining at me. Mer- what did I say it was? Mer- I'm losing the battle. <laughs> wait, wait, one more time. You enjoyed this month? Women's. Yay! Air five. Heck yeah.